baby. Yeah, that's what I'm here to talk about, Ice Ice Baby. It's so wonderful to be here at HU. <laughs> that's right, feeling all the love from our community. I want to talk a little bit tonight about the ice and how we're seeing the ice change. I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that we're able to address that with the NASA missions. And so let me start off a little bit with the NASA vision. It's to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that we do and learn will benefit all of humankind. And then of the mission, I want you to focus on that last line that says the stewardship of Earth. At the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which I just reached my 25th year anniversary there, supporting awesome science. And the science we focus there is on heliophysics, earth science, astrophysics, and planetary science. I've been very fortunate that my career and training at Howard University and MIT started off in learning how to control spacecraft, as you see here and then going on to be a, a headquarters program exec, and then finally being an instrument manager and actually managing instruments for spacecraft missions, starting from $10 million up to $500 million. And in this case, ISAT-2, which you see here, is a billion-dollar mission. So when we're able to look at the changes in the environment, and particularly in Earth's environment, we use a collaborative observing network. And that ultimately is to provide the consumers, our communities, with information on weather. Knowing things like how our long-term and mid-term climate is changing, extreme weather occurring, and the way that our electrological systems and the carbon cycle as we see it are all interacting together. We're going to focus mainly on that ecosystem and carbon cycle, and the sun and earth interaction. So ice plays an extremely vital role in our global environment. I mean, we, we know about the precipitation and condensation, but really we look at how is the weather changing, the water rising, and ice is changing. Those things all affect our communities. In particular, ice is, is being an enormous impact to the, the change in our temperatures around the globe. Goddard leads that challenge by using observing satellites, as you see here. So I mentioned before there was a mission there, LOLA. It's actually Lunar Reconnaissance Orbit, and LOLA is a laser altimeter. If you look at that first photo of Apollo, not much detail, 1960s. We are now able to create maps that have a resolution of three centimeters. So I'm going to allow some of our scientists here, uh, Dr. Tom Newman and uh, Thorsten uh, Markley, will talk a little bit about how we actually do the concept of ISAT. satellite data. This is kind of how our Earth looks like. We can see oceans, we can see the sea ice, we can see our forest. What is much, much harder to measure is how high things are on a global scale. Almost impossible. ISAT-2 adds the third dimension, the elevation. Repeating measurements from ISAT-2 will allow us to measure changes in the ice sheets or in the ocean or in land. ISA-2 is designed to measure the changes that are going on in the cryosphere, in the polar regions. All the change is at the edges. Those are the steeply sloping parts of the glacier that interact with the ocean, and that's where all the action is. That's where all the mass is being lost. In order to estimate the mass changes, we need to know the height of things. The, the mission ISA-2 carries a single instrument. It's called ATLAS, the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System. Atlas sends out small pulses of laser light 10,000 times a second. And by measuring precisely how long it takes that light to go from the spacecraft down to the Earth and back up to the spacecraft allows us to figure out what the height of the surface is beneath ISAT-2. We need to measure the time of flight of a single photon or a single laser pulse with a precision of a billionth of a second. 
NASA engineers had to come up with entirely new ways of measuring time very precisely. A billionth of a second translates to an elevation change precision of just a few centimeters. Climate change is amplified in the polar regions. ISA 2 is designed to measure those areas and will help us to understand what's going on with our planet. We want to be able to look at things that you can see, the elevation, the crevices, the cracks. We want to be able to look all well at the tree canopy surfaces. It takes us 10,000 photons per second to be able to make these measurements. And we only capture a few. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the life of an Atlas photon is. It shoots down from the surface of the spacecraft. Attention photons. Prepare to measure Earth's changing ice. Laser pulse 22A4. Departs in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Excellent job, Bo. Your travel time has been recorded. Let's add it to the elevation data set. Ready the next group? Insanely cool is right. So, unfortunately, it's insanely terrible what's happening to our sheets, ice sheets. And so some of the data that we've been able to collect has shown that this is the Jakobius fin, uh, glacier. It's melting, one of the fastest melting glaciers in Greenland. In 10 years, we've lost more than we've lost in the previous 100 years in terms of ice. I'm about to show you an actual calving event where the ice begins to break apart. This ice that broke apart is about the size of Manhattan. It's one of the largest glacier cleaving events we've ever seen. We're just observers. These two little dots on the side of the mountain. We watched and recorded the largest witness calving event ever caught on tape. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. 
I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took 100 years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. So we live in a very delicate balance with the sun. We can't alter its pattern. So we must be very mindful of what we can alter. In particular, when we look at things like the changing of the seasons and ice, we see that the ice is decreasing and the sea ice is also melting. Things are no longer coming back, as you say, the growth periods, they're shortened. And why is that? Well, we notice the effect of soot. I just had a friend who went to Alaska last week and she saw black on the surface of ice. Well, where do you think it comes from? It comes from pollution, from carbon. So as a result, I want you to think about the things that you can do to change that variability that we have the ability to change, which is carbon cycle. Our carbon burning fuels and cars, the things that we actually do not think about when we put fertilizer in the ground, all of these have an impact on an environment. And it's been told by many scientists that this is the thing that they think we can actually change. So what are we doing in the United States? It's not all completely bad. We've actually said that we're doing about 30% of recycling. And think about recycling something as simple as aluminum can, because many times people say, oh, this doesn't have an impact, but it does. An aluminum can, to make a new one, takes 95% more energy than just recycling one. You can save the energy on the order of, say, running your TV for three hours. We are also being very creative and innovative by creating new technologies like hybrid cars and being able to use uh, old blue jeans to make insulation. But I want you to know that it takes all of us. The diversity that ideas are afforded, the ability to collide and spark innovation is important. Things like the International Space Station don't happen without your ability to be involved and engaged. We see no boundaries from space. Gene Roddenberry believed that space was for everyone, like the Star Trek crew, and it is the children here in this audience, the students at Howard, you are part of that vision of diversity. Be impactful. Remember to aim high, as I say, shoot for the moon, and even if you miss, you'll still be amongst the stars. I always say peace because I believe in peace and not war, but positive energy activates continuous elevation. Thank you for having me tonight and enjoy. Let's kick it.